Hey guys, I'm Sai and welcome to Ace Podcast Nation, the home of our original series, My Story. This is series two and uh, for those of you uh, who watched series one, we had all sorts of characters and uh, and guests on. This is always a fun series. Uh, Ace Podcast Nation, of course, you're home to many other great shows and series featuring top guests, expert analysts and more. My Story, like all our other shows and series, you can get in video format, youtube.com slash Nation. Please do subscribe, click the bell for notifications, and of course you can get the audio version at uh, the usual podcast and radio platforms, all under the Ace Podcast Nation banner. Uh, the My Story series is unique as we take our guests through their life and career, basically from birth and their upbringing right up to present day, as they uh, they share a few memories and anecdotes along the way. Uh, series 1, as I mentioned, featured actors, footballers, broadcasters, authors, and more and series two is no different uh the tagline is simple for this one real conversations with real people and uh, i'm delighted to welcome my guest today he is uh, an actor filmmaker and presenter mr johnny owen welcome johnny how are you my friend i'm very good thanks it's very nice to be here indeed welcome back as it were because uh, you of course were one of my first guests really way back at the start of the channel which seems like a a very long time ago now, but uh, yes, so you're back. After I think I, I nagged you into submission to finally get you back on. But um, no, I'm happy, very happy to have you. And what I like to do with this series is uh, we start, at the, we're at the beginning, and uh, you kind of just tell us a little bit about you and where you were, where you were brought up in God's country, as it were, and uh, just uh, where it all began for you, really. Yeah, well, I'm born and bred in uh, Merthyr Tydfil in the South Wales Valleys. Um, I was born in 1971. Um, yeah, I've got two brothers, one older, one younger. A very, I suppose, what you'd call now a traditional Merthyr and class Merthyr background. My father worked in heavy industry all his life. He was, a, he was an electrician. Uh, he worked underground in the steelworks. Um, and my mother was uh, was a care worker. So, yeah, I went to, a, to, went to the local comprehensive. Uh, which was in a castle, actually. People are always think of some kind of private school, but it's not. It just happened to be in a castle. <laughs> um, but yeah, I went there to a comp. Um, very happy childhood. Big extended family. Lots of cousins. Lots of friends. Lots of football played in the nights. Um, you know, and you know, just very lucky, really, where I'm from and where I come from and my family and all the rest of it. And uh, yeah, I had a really good, happy childhood. Yeah, I was. Um, I was speaking to my oldest son. Uh, a couple of days ago, he's 16 now, and he um, he was like, what did you do, Dad, when you were little? Like, what, what, what did you do to pass the time? Like, you didn't have internet, and you didn't have phones, and you didn't have this. And I was like, well, we kind of just went outside and entertained ourselves, played football, or just hung around. He couldn't get his head around it at all. He was uh, very sort of confused by it, but they're so used to having everything at their fingertips. They've grown up with it. They don't know any different, but... Like obviously, I think you're you're a little bit older than me, but you have to find your own ways to entertain yourself, really. In in terms of when you are out and about with your mates and that. Yeah, um, I mean, I, 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 I was saying the other day to my mate, we played football all the time. So basically, I'd go into school, 
like an hour before the bell rang because we'd all be in the yard playing football. And then as soon as the break bell went, played football, dinner time, football, you know, you ate quickly. And then after school, like if you know, obviously you had a bit of homework, or whatever, but you basically met your mates and you played football. And that's what you did all weekend. You played Wembley, this game we used to play. And you know, I, you know, you'd get a ball yourself or your mates got a ball and they'd always be what we used to call the school field, which is by us, which is where everybody kind of went to play. You know, we had bikes and things like that, as you said, but you just spent all all the time outside. You know, you, you just kind of like, you spent, you know, there was no, there was no internet. There was no, you know, like I say, smartphones and any of those kind of things. You just kind of made your own fun and all the rest of it. It was great, you know, and like I said, it was only two or three channels when I was a kid. Um, but, you know, I was very happy and I, and I really enjoyed it because I think you were, you know, you were active all the time and, and you were out and about, you know, running about the place, really. And obviously, your mother and father used to do this great thing where they'd go, what are you doing in? Go on, get out. Yeah. They used to have a brilliant line where he'd say to my mates that were in, go, hey, it's not a bloody youth club. Go on, get out. <laughs> <laughs> you like went... Out and about, you know? Yeah, 100%. I um, used to... My mum and or my dad would half time they'd have to come get me because it was getting dark or I hadn't come back for tea because you go out in the morning on in the summer holidays or the weekends, go out in the morning and be playing football all day. Yeah. And then they'd have to come and get you for your tea or your yeah. dinner and uh, it was getting dark. Yeah. Jonathan a shout and also do you remember that thing where you do where you'd like you take some biscuits out of your pocket or a piece of bread? Yeah. And that would last you like, you know, that'd be <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, you'd put some the tie your jumper around your waist. Stick. You sometimes find a stick when you carry around all day. Yeah, brilliant, really. You know, I was quite lucky, really. Merth is a kind of industrial old mining town, really, but it's got, you know, the valleys are kind of rural if you just walk for a bit. So this is kind of like really interesting mix of the urban and the rural, really, in places like Merthyr, which is which is fantastic. You know, we had best of both worlds, I suppose. Yeah, 100%. And like you say, happy memories. Like, they're, they're, for me, they're some of my happiest memories, of, you know, of my whole life is uh, the, those years of where you were old enough to go out on your own, but you were young enough that you didn't really have, like, you know, dramas with girls and things like this. It was yeah. just, all you cared about was playing football with your mates and just, uh, yeah, very fond memories. Um, you, you've talk, you talked uh, about your dad and your mum a lot on your, you know, like your Facebook page and you always tell stories about different things. And um, it does seem like you've got, like, and you've had a fantastic uh, relationship with them over the years. What... Um, what sort of influence have they had on you, you know, as a person, and and also, you know, over your career as well? Well, my my mother and father, my mother's still alive. My dad passed uh, four years ago uh, last week, um, but he he literally was seventy eight, uh, and he had a very he was he was very much a man of of a different age in a respect. And I know we always say that you know the industrial revolution happened and men worked in major industries, and that's mostly gone now. Um, but they did have a kind of a very specific way of of behaving and a way of life, I suppose. My dad was very much of that sort of, uh, of that school really. Mm -hmm. um, and I liked him a lot, you know, I, he was very funny. He had a great sense of humor. He had a very, very strong mm -hmm. work ethic. He was always sort of saying to me, it's really important you earn. It's really important you pay your bills. Um, you know, and, and he used to go for a few pints most night down the local social club with his friends. Um, he was very happy in Merthyr. He was never, never wanted to move, never interested in him. Uh, he travelled a lot, uh, and he was in the British Army for a bit, but he was never interested in living anywhere else other than Merthyr. So we had strong roots in the town, and you know, my grandparents lived there on my father's side, lots of cousins, like I said. So I kind of, I had a very strong network of, you know, an extended, big extended family, you'd call it, you know. So, and also I went to a local comp. I was born, you know, when, uh, in the 70s, so the NHS was, you know, as it's, as it's proved to be when the COVID was very important in people's lives um you know so i kind of i felt that i had every opportunity that you could possibly have to get on i genuinely believe that a very good education system in south wales where there's a big emphasis on it as you know you know go to school learn get qualifications and if you possibly can get to university that was my own man's advice and my mother's as well so i was very lucky to have them really you know and i always had a good even to the end, really, I always had a, a relationship with my dad where he was my father. I remember him saying to me once, you know, he was, he was on about something and I had done something. He went, I'm not your friend. Don't mm -hmm. talk to me as if I'm, your, I'm not your mate, my father. And I, and I understood what he meant by that. He was like, don't take the piss, you know. Yeah. Can't act a certain way with me. I'm your father. And I was like, yes, I know, I'm sorry. You know, I've done something. 
Um, so he always had that. So I respected him massively. You know, I respected you know what he would say, and uh, and I'm glad I had that relationship with him. I'm glad that he was was he was like, and and he had a big effect on my career in the sense of I ended up even making the last film that I did, Three Kings, was kind of was about him because I was interested in the characters, Jock Steen, Bill Shankly, and Matt Busby, that I felt he had similar values to, um, and I wanted to do something about that because it reminded me of him. Yeah, I think um, it's, 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 it's strange because you go full circle and like a lot of the things which I remember my father saying to me, similar to what you just said there, like, I know your mate, I'm your father, yeah. And yeah. just all these little, these little things which you know just come up in sort of day to day life. If they're playing up or being a bit cheeky or you know, yeah. whatever it may be, I find myself saying the same things to my three sons now. They're yeah. like they're, they're twelve to sixteen, the three of them, and I I say it, and like as I'm saying it, I'm thinking I remember my dad saying that to yeah. me. It's uh, it's it's like a full circle, yeah. but um, so growing up in Merthyr. When you kind of got to, you know, the sort of teenage years, were you, you know, still keen playing football and stuff? Were you good at football? Was there ever a chance of you sort of going down a, a sporting route career-wise? I was all right. You know, I was I was like, I could play in like a local, local team and hold my own. But I, I I thought pretty quickly when I got to about 14, 15, I, could, I knew I wasn't. I think the thing is with footballers is, I always say this, to become a professional footballer, you've got to be exceptionally good. You know, they are almost freaks of nature footballers. Um, and I got to the age, I was doing a bit of boxing as well, and I was doing all right with that, you know, but I thought somebody was very, very good again. And I thought to myself then, you know, Mark Pembridge was my age, who had a, a pretty good career with Wales, and he went to Everton, Luton, Benfica. And I remember my grandfather saying to me, he was, he was a little red-headed kid going, he'll make it the ginger boy. And I can remember being about 99 going, what about me? What about me? Mm -hmm. To be honest to you, he's a he's a player. <laughs> so, you know, I realised quite early on that you know I wasn't going to have I didn't have the uh, I wasn't good enough to go you know become a professional footballer and I was all right with that. I was fine with it. I, I enjoyed playing. I loved watching football. I loved watching football as much as playing. Still do. Um, and so that was fine with me. And I obviously I got into sort of uh, music in a big way and I was playing the guitar and stuff. And I did fancy being a rock star with that. I did think oh I can. I can do this one. So I was, um, yeah, I loved the game. And you know what? The thing with football is, it's given, me a, it's given me a livelihood. You know, I ended up, ironically, presenting stuff like Soccer Sunday, working permanently for uh, HTV, as it was called then, ITV World Sport. And even now, I've ended up working for Talk Sport, doing stuff, making films, working for Forest, you know, doing media stuff, writing a column. So in some ways, football has given me a living without... Being a professional. Yeah, without playing. Yeah, yeah exactly. So and I'm very, very happy with that. I've, um, I've really enjoyed it. You know, I love the game. And I love talking about it, and I love being part of it. Do you um, do you remember the first sort of first game you went to watch? I do. I went to the first ever game I went to watch. Now this is where it gets really trippy. I was talking about this the other day. I was with some lads, and I was like talking about something, and I went, "Oh, do you remember that time we went to um, Sellers Park to watch thing, and this happened?" And they went. No, that was at uh, Brisbane Road when we went to watch Wrexham. And I was like, no, 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 it was at Sellers Park. And they were like, no. And I got it wrong. But I was mm. in my in mind, I'd got it right. And this happens all the time. And me and my mates always talk about it. We'll say, oh, remember that Villa game we went to against Liverpool and something go, it was against Everton. So you kind of like remember. So I think the first game I went to, it was definitely a Merthyr game. And it was either against Chesham in the FA Cup or it was a friendly against Watford. It was about the same time. Um, and they won the game against Watford. They came from 2 0 down and won 3 2. And I think it was to open a new stand or something. And the, or the Cheshire game was them getting the second round of the FA Cup and trying to get to the third round for the first time. And I remember walking to that game from my grandfather's house. We lived quite close to the ground with my father. And we were walking towards the ground. We were a bit late and somebody scored. And he stopped mm -hmm. into the crowd. And then somebody scored. And we were trying to work out who. So it was definitely a Merthyr game. And it would have been in the late 70s. It had been about six or seven years old but that was definitely one of the first two games i went to excellent that's a that's a pretty good memory i struggle i do trying to remember the, yeah. oh, the yeah. early games it's really bad like yeah the older i get i i just just can't quite i can picture it but i just yeah. can't remember the finer details and it's uh yeah. it's a part of growing up and age i suppose age. but uh, with them um, like you mentioned you were 
you know you were you were very interested in music and you fancied being a a rock star where did you sort of your your career aspirations go then as you left school 16 like where were you sort of what direction were you going in, in at that point I stayed on for a year when I was 16. I only got four O levels, but you know, this was 1987, but that was enough to get you in, you know, to the sixth form they call it then. I think they call it sixth mm. form college now. So I decided to take some A levels, and I always remember the teacher trying to talk me out of it. Bless them, going, you're better off just going on a YTS or getting a, an apprenticeship, because, you know. But I was like, no, no, I'll, I'll give this a crack. And they were right. It got over eight months in, and the only A level I was going to get was in it was in Neighbours, the TV programme, because mm. I was just staying all day. And, and, and watching telly because I I remember going to sixth form and, and then somebody going, um, you don't have to be here. And I was like, you don't have to turn up. And they were like, no. I was like, oh, okay. So I stopped going in. And it got to the springtime and I was 16 going on 17 and my dad went, I'll never forget it. I was asleep in my grandfather's house in bed and he came in, he had his work overalls on and he kicked the bottom of the bed and I woke up and he went, come on, you join in the, uh, the army or the RAF or something. And I went, what? And he went, come on. I'm getting you done in the recruiting office. You, you, you're not going to school. I'm getting you in the forces. And it was enough for me to go, all right, all right, I, I'll get something sorted. So what I did was I applied to go on um, a, a YTS computer course where you get the YTS money for a week, but you can do computers at Ponty College for a year. And at the end of it, you get a qualification. And I did that for a year. Um, and I passed it. And I managed to get into Hoover's, which was a, it still is a big factor. I remember I really employed thousands of people then. I got into Hoover's the offices as a computer boy. My mom, my mom was delighted with this because computers are the future. Well done, son. So I got in as a computer boy. And I was there for a few years, um, but I hated it. I hated what I was doing. Uh, and in that time, I was I was playing the guitar and the bass guitar, and I got very friendly with, with another lad, and we decided to form a band. So the the work in Hoover's, which was just an office job, was just paying for me to be in a band, really. Yeah. Um, and then what happened was the band started doing quite well uh, over time. We got some big support. We said, well, in excess, we were a big band at the time. And we played with all the local people like Stereophonics and all them. It was a good time, really, for Welsh bands and Welsh music. Um, and then Hoover's, the department got shut down and I was offered redundancy, which I took. It was the princely sum of £9,000. This was all right. This was in the yeah. 90s. So at that point, Simon, I decided I was going to go back to university. I thought, I'm going to do my A-levels properly now. I've tried work. I've got the band. I fancy being a student. Because I'd looked at students and thought, that's not a bad life. <laughs> so I went and I did A-levels for a year. And I got a few A-levels under my belt. And I went to Swansea University to study history. Because they, they had still have a brilliant history department. Four-star rating at the time. So I, went, I wanted to go there. And I ended up doing a degree in, in history while playing in a band. And the band never quite made it in the sense of, we got signed, but we never got in the charts and stuff. And then by you know a bit of luck, a, a TV star, CD started in filming in Merthyr Tidville called Nuts and Bolts, which was on HTV. And um, I went to some auditions for that and got the part. And that kind of set me on the path then for sort of constantly being in media and working in, in media. And that was it really, a bit of luck. A little bit of hard work um, mixed and uh, kind of ended up where I am today. Yeah, and I mean, obviously, fast forward to 2021 and you've got these uh, fantastic films out which you've made, which we will get to in a minute. And of course, you've done a bit of everything, really. You've done acting and and uh, you've done radio, of course, which we'll get to in just a sec. What's your preferred sort of, of all the things that you've done over the years, like if you had to pick one gun to your head and said, right, that's what you have to do for the rest of your life. You're not allowed to do anything else. What's the one thing that you, which you've done that you would, which, that you would pick? Great question. I really enjoy them all. They've all been great. It was great being in a band. It was great playing live music. I love that. Um, acting is brilliant as well. It's good. You know, it's great. It's very rewarding. Uh, doing the presenting. I love it. I love being on radio. I like, I like writing, like the con. But I think if you, if you had to put a gun to my head, I'd say which one I've loved making films. I've loved directing and making football films. I really enjoyed doing I Believe in Miracles, Don't Take Me Home and Three Kings. I've really enjoyed them. It's great because you can create your own story and your own world the way you see it, you know, and I think that's that's something that really appeals to me and, and I really enjoy doing is being able to tell the story that I want to tell. So if you yeah, then gun to the head, it's making films. 
so I believe in miracles was the first one you made, wasn't it? That was the first yeah. film that you made. Like, how did that come about? Like, how did it sort of go from a, an idea to a, a reality? I suppose. Well, I d- I done. It was the first film that I directed. Yeah, you're right. I, I had written a film before, which was a dra- a comedy called Svengali, which uh, was yeah, of course, Universal. Um, that that was the first time I'd kind of gone into the right inside of it. Um, but what happened was I moved to Nottingham in 2014, I think it was 13, and somebody in Nottingham had seen something I did, which Cardiff City fans really remember. It was like a little five minute film I made before the FA, FA Cup. FA Cup final. Yeah, 2008. Yes. I made this little film and it went down really well. And some this guy in Nottingham had seen it, and he said to me, "Look, uh, his name is Craig Chapel, and he he, he ran the." Um, this, this production company and also a media college up here. And he said to me, look, I really like what you did. Would you be interested in doing something about the great Nottingham Forest team of the late 70s that won the double European Cup? And I went, oh, yeah, I, I remember that team fondly from my youth. So I was like, I'd like to sort of have a go at that. I started doing it, and I realised pretty quickly within a week that it was a really good story because obviously those five years under Clef were, were magical. So I took it to Universal again. I took it to Baby Cow when they agreed. Uh, and it became a much bigger thing then and then you know we were offered a film release on it you know and and the dvd big dvd release and it was picked up by bt sports so it became a, a, a much bigger thing than it was originally in, intended to be and i think uh, that year it was the biggest sports film doc at the uk box office it did really really well in, in cinemas uh, because there's, there's an appetite now for doc sports documentaries especially you know people will go to the cinemas to watch them it, it began really with when we were kings and senna um, so I, I that did really well, and then it sold a lot of DVDs. Again, how time moves in their DVDs. Mm-hmm. Sold a lot of DVDs really quickly that Christmas, and then it did really well critically. You know, got lots of great reviews. So yeah, that was all that lucky about. It was just blo- one bloke who'd seen something I'd done, said to my fancy doing a story. I give it a go, and the story is so interesting. I feel that uh, people just went, yeah, we'll have a bit of that, and uh, it did really well. It's amazing, isn't it? How like. Um some in which maybe would have started off as sort of like a small project just developed really quickly and then the other thing which amazes me is like 2015 that came out and like you mentioned the dvd sales like we're only sort of five six years on and dvd sales are pretty much dead aren't they really oh. i mean you would well, know better than me but like well, gone you got you got like so that would be a great example so that for example i'm not being on exaggerating you I believe in miracles would probably have sold all that Christmas and that time around about a hundred thousand DVDs. Now you'd be looking at three or four thousand. That wow. that dramatic a, a collapse, it's extraordinary. And it's all streaming now because it all goes to Netflix and Amazon and onto the channels. So it's kind of done, really. The DVD market there's no there's no real incentive to go down that route anymore. You, you're better off speaking to your Netflix and Amazons and now Apple and all these other channels as well. Yeah, like it goes back to what we were saying at the start of the show about everything's at fingertip touch and it like yeah. everything is available on some sort of streaming service yeah. somewhere. And um you mentioned uh Sven Gali. I know we, we talked about that a bit on the the first time you came on the channel, but I do want to touch on it because obviously uh, it started off as like a, a series on YouTube, I think it was, wasn't it? Yeah, it was it was a web series. It started with two friends of mine, Phil John and Dean Kavanagh. And we had this idea just to film stuff. And in those days, again, it was, again, my memory, I'm trying to think, I don't think you could upload that much stuff on YouTube. It was much more difficult. This is like the mid to late noughties, like mm. well, 10 years ago. So I don't even think Twitter had come out at one point when we started. <laughs> so it was all very new to us. And we just like, decided to put some stuff up on the internet. You know, the internet at the time was as, like it is now in my respect. YouTube was just for like videos of cats on skateboards and stuff like that, you know. Um, there was no idea really of like actually putting films and drama on there, and that's what we try to do really. We try to put something that every month somebody would tune into and um, enjoy, and it really took off. We got loads and loads of views and loads of interaction. And what we did was we I tried to get people from the music industry to play themselves, and they did. People loved doing that, um, and we got some great people. Alan Alan McGee getting on board was a big moment because once you get Alan, so many people fall into into wanting to do it as well and it was great it was a lot of fun and it like i said it got picked up by a production company and then universal got involved and we made it into a film so it just goes to show from sometimes a little thing can you know can um things can grow and become something that you could never have 
of imagined, really. And uh, I've been very lucky, like I said, that things have developed. Plenty of stuff has fallen by the wayside. You know what I mean? So you can you remember these because they become something. And there's lots of stuff we tried and never quite come off. But that's part of it. You learn from them and um, try better next time. Yeah, it's it's, uh, it's ideas, isn't it? it like you you're gonna be full of ideas. Not every idea is gonna materialize or, or go into what you initially thought it might or could be it's, that's uh, i suppose that's part of it what um you obviously you've done a bit of acting here and there over the years have you got like a favorite uh, a favorite role from any of your acting i really liked um doing nuts and bolts when i started it was this like really funny little welsh drama series i'm very uh fond and nostalgic of my time on there, I had, a, I had a great time. They were brilliant people. I acted with Roger Evans and Eve Miles, who's done really well. And Roger, they've done great. I, I really, I really liked doing that. That was, um, that was a start for me. And I, you know, I was quite young then, and the summers never seemed to end. And the weather was nice. And we were filming in Merthyr, which is my hometown. So yeah, I really, um, I really enjoyed doing that. That's probably my favourite. And like I said, it's like anything. It's like when you first start doing something, it's always, it always seems to be better, doesn't it? When you first start, and you don't get used to it. Oh, yeah, I think it was my time on Nuts and Bolts, really. Yeah, I mean, you've done, you did Shameless, didn't you, for a bit? And um, I thought it was good fun as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's um, that's just one of those series which was like quite a cult thing, wasn't it? And yeah. like it's still going uh, as an American version now. I think I don't watch it myself, but I think there's an American version which is still really? going. Of it's, uh, it's, it's really interesting. There's a few series like British series from around that sort of time which are finished in the uk which are now going on you know a us version which is kind of interesting because it's normally the other way around historically i think we normally get their tv shows after them but there we go um what was i gonna ask you um oh yeah this is england uh you had a little uh, a little roll in as well that um I love that that series and the film series of that. Do you think we ever see another, um, like another film or another series of that? Might do. I mean, I did a little guest appearance because obviously my missus is um, is Vicky McClure, who's one of yeah. the and um, Shane Meadows, the director, has become a very good friend of mine, and he's a great lad. So he was kind of like, "Come in, and just do a little part," and I was like, "Yeah, right then." So hmm. you know, I was very happy to do that because I was like, "You was a massive fan before I ever met Vicky and Shane." I thought. Uh, I think Shane's one of our best film directors, really, of the last 20, 30 years, certainly. Um, I, I, they do mention it from time to time. It'd be interesting to see if they do. I, I think it's something that they can bring back in five years, ten years. I think the, Shane, from what I understand, likes the idea of giving it a bit of time so that he can tell a bit of a story. Then. Because if you give it five yeah. time, there's, there's a good backstory to tell. But it's certainly something that um, I think they've, uh, they, they, they think... I like me that it's one of the best things that's been on TV for the last you know few decades, and so it's always got a chance of uh, of being resurrected when it's that good, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so obviously, you did I I believe in miracles, and then uh, of course you did uh, Don't Take Me Home, which is obviously a personal favourite of mine, being a Welsh proud Welshman. Um, that's got to take a special place in your sort of when you look back at all the work you've done being a Welshman yourself and being being there to experience what was so, like such a special uh, special period in Welsh football and to be able to sort of document it and make this this film which all Welsh fans love and have watched about a million times if they're anything like me that's got to take a special part in your career surely yeah it's massive I mean I, like you say that Kind of, that was a real labour. I love to do that. I was very lucky that you know I'd, I'd got into a position after I believe in miracles that the Welsh chef A sort of said to me, "Would you be interested in doing the story of uh, the 2016 and the Euros and that amazing summer?" So I was I snapped their hand off to say yes, and and they went, "Look, you know we want to put it out on March 1st, St David's Day, following year 2017, which is a very very quick turnaround in film terms." But I was happy to do it. So you know, long long days spent in the edit suite making sure it was done collecting footage getting fan footage and all that kind of stuff but then i gotta give a lot of credit to the welsh football association they were fantastic they basically said to me look we know you're a wales fan i've been since you were a kid we know that you know you can make a football film so just go away and make it and we'll see you on the uh, on the premiere mm -hmm. i was like okay yeah. they, never did fear. they never bothered me they, they give me all the footage i wanted they give me all the support 
I couldn't, you know, I, I genuinely can't speak highly enough of, of how they were about me doing it. And, you know, they were really pleased with the results. It did really well. Obviously, in Wales, it's done spectacularly well. It gets mm-hmm. on every now and then, and people love it. And you know what? Whatever happens, you know, and in 20, 30, 30 years, when filmmaking and, and technology changes again, at least we'll have, like, a Polaroid snapshot of what it's mm-hmm. like. Yeah, 100%. And I think uh, even now... Like I'll see every now and again on social media, someone will like put a message up or a comment up on your Facebook or something, and they'll say, oh, "I watched Don't uh, Don't Take Me Home last night again, reliving yeah. it." Yeah. And like I've done it a few times, just relived it. The question on all uh, all Welsh people's lips is that, though: Will we see a sequel? <laughs> well, it depends how well we do. I mean, we're we're talking now and, and tomorrow night we play Belgium which is a really tough game for the Europe, for the World Cup qualifiers I'll take a point there um, but yeah absolutely I, if, we'll see how it goes this summer I mean that's the point I I didn't go to France to make a film I was I was out there as a fan which I think was good really because I really enjoyed it as a fan I wasn't worried about footage and filming and coverage I was just there as a fan so when I came back and uh, the Welsh Football Association, again, because they, they're very cute, they got a, a, a company called Tiny Media who work with them, who were brilliant, who had lots and lots of footage of different things behind the scenes and training and the players, very comfortable. So, you know, it might be that if we have another tournament, anything like the other, we'll have the footage and we'll uh, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But I'm, I'm going to do the same, you know, I'm just going to enjoy it as a fan because we've qualified again, which is brilliant. Uh, and then we'll see, we'll see what happens. But, uh, yeah, listen, I... I, I remember walking to the city ground in Nottingham and a Forest fan said to me, I think he'd had a few, but he said to me, I watch I Believe in Miracles every Saturday night, Johnny, after a few mm-hmm. pints. And I've had a few Wales fans say similar things that if on a Friday night they get in or whether it's just pre-COVID or if they're in and they've had a few cans, sometimes they just stick it on just to go back to that summer. And that's that's everything to me. Somebody saying that to me makes it all worthwhile. Can't fault you. I um, It's going to be a weird one for the Euros this this summer isn't it because it's just such a shame like you've got uh home nation teams there but it's like you still don't know whether there's going to be a full influx of fans and stuff because of covid and stuff like that it's just not sure where it's gonna gonna go and what's what the tournament's gonna look like as a whole which is a bit of a shame but um how do you see wales doing in the euros well, like like always with Wales, we massively, massively rely on on some players. We have some world class players on their day. Obviously, like Gareth Bale and Aaron Ramsey. You know, Aaron's already pulled out of the squad for tomorrow night, and that affects us. I've heard this afternoon that Ben Davis is out as well, which is such a shame. Um, and that's that's always been our problem: strength and depth. Now, noises have been made that, especially during the last few games in the League of Nations and stuff. Uh, that some players, you know, were able to step in, and the, and the drop in quality wasn't too bad, you know. But we do drop down to sort of championship players, you know. And, and yeah. That. So that's what's tough for us. And listen, Belgium are arguably the best team in the world with France at the moment. So you know, it's going to be a very difficult um, job to go there and get any kind of result. But you know what? If we can nick a draw, yeah, we'd all be happy. Yeah. But you know what I mean? So and we've done it. We've gone there before on a draw, and we've beaten them at home. And, we do seem to be a bit of a bogey team for Belgium. I just hope they don't try and reverse it tomorrow night. But I think we've got a chance. I think, you know, it'll depend on how good Gareth Bale is. I think Gareth Bale is arguably one of our greatest ever players with John Charles. Um, I, in some ways, I think he's probably our best player now. Sometimes I think it's Charles. I, I change a little bit my my mind. But if he's on form, then you've always got a chance, you know? Yeah, I think so. I think, although I still say... Whilst I think Gareth Bale is probably the greatest Welsh player of all time, I still think that uh, when Aaron Ramsey doesn't play, it can sometimes have a bigger effect on the team overall because he kind of puts links everything together and he's quite cute with his passing. And I almost think, like, especially where Daniel James has emerged a little bit, yeah. Bale has got a little bit less pressure on him. In, to perform, like the pressure's still there, it's always going to be there when you're the, the main man. But when Aaron Ramsey's not there, we do seem to just struggle a little bit sometimes to be a bit agree. disjointed. It's like in 2016 when Aaron didn't play in the semi final and Ben 
Davis against Portugal. We missed them. And the same, you know, that final World Cup qualifier against Ireland when Bale didn't play, we missed him. You know, we're just a better team with the two of them fit in that team. It's just a fact. Because any country would miss their best two players. Of any, any country, Brazil, Italy, doesn't matter if you can two best players are out. It's tough. Um, Dan James has been a massive, massive, uh, you know, the last few weeks. Also, like, um, the boy Robert at Leeds has shown some form. Kiefer Moore, I think, is is arguably the best player in the championship up front and might be difficult for City to keep hold of him for next season if he keeps playing the way he does because he causes everybody problems. Harry Wilson's had a good season. So up front, them four, you think, well, you know, that's not too bad. We've been really unlucky with injuries like David Brooks and, and Ramsey not being fit. is a shame, really. Um, and like Ben Davis. But, you know, we've got some good boys in the back. It's just you need them playing. You know, you yeah. need your Rodens and, your, and and these boys, you need them playing week in, week out. Goalkeeper's another one, you know. Danny Ward is a great goalkeeper and he's at Leicester. And Leicester are not going to get him, let him go anywhere else because they want all the Premier League clubs are holding talent. And I've got, I've got boys on the bench to cover in case Michael gets injured. That's no good. Danny Ward no. should be playing somewhere because it's not the same when you're not playing. So, you know, we, we're always fighting against, I, I think all the managers say the same. I'd rather pick players who are playing and players who are on the bench maybe at higher profile clubs because there's nothing like game experience. Yeah, it's a tricky one. Like Kiefer Moore, I wasn't um, overly, as a Cardiff fan, I wasn't overly massively happy with his signing because I just felt like he was quite similar to what they already, like they had Glatzel. But I was really impressed me with him because I was always being impressed with him at playing for Wales. Yeah. But when he played for, I think it was Wigan before, I never really thought he was doing that well. But what's really impressed me is his uh, his all round game. It's not just that he's like a you know a big target man. Like he's really good at linking up the play, and he's he's, he's good with the ball at his feet. And I just think he's. Uh, I agree with you. I think Cardiff will struggle to keep hold of him in the summer. Just he scored so many goals, and he's been so impressive all season. Those sorts of players don't stay in the championship long. But he was last summer at Forest. They tried to sign him as well. I know that. Uh, he had a few options. They'd been watching him again. They tried to sign him, and he went to City in the end. And fair play to him. But there was about. He's always a sign when five or six clubs are in for you. Um, oh, yeah. Like you said, it's the same this summer. If City don't go up, it's going to be tough for him to hold on to him because any club would would you'd think even if other than the top maybe four or five, you would stick him on, wouldn't you, with the last ten minutes? Yeah, just cause it. You know what I'm saying? So you'd always, and they've got so much money in the Premier League. The clubs, they can do that. They can buy the players and just keep them because, you know, they're able to do it. And the player, you can't blame the player because suddenly the player could be offered double his wages. You know, so it's such a, it's such a top-heavy game, money-wise, and it's so hard to keep a young player who's come through or somebody who's showing a bit of decent form because their heads get turned by the money and the profile of of the Premier League. So you can't blame them. I never blame them. You know, it's like that's football. Yeah, and like look, just very quickly, like if you look at West Ham, they signed Jared Bowen. He didn't really play for probably six months, yeah. but they could afford to just have him on the bench just in case five minutes here and there. He's he is playing a little bit a bit more now, but then they signed Ben Rama and like those two players in the championship with like Brentford and um, I think it was bad Jared Bowen playing for Hull. Hull, that's right, and um, like they were their massive. Big big game players, and yeah. West Ham just took them and then played them, you know, on the bench and that. I've seen, um, seen, I watched him a few times, Jared Bowen. I could see he was one of the best players in the championship, a bit like yeah. Keith. Um, and St. Forest had a player called Matty Cash, who was patently head and shoulders a right back, and he went to Villa in the summer. A uh, lovely kid, and you can't blame him. Do you know what I mean? No. Like trebled his wages, and he went to play in the Premier League. So you know, they, once their heads are turned, and you know, you get some fans who go like, you know. Judas leaving the club, you're like, oh, hang on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Whenever you're working, if somebody come in and offered you three times to go down the road, you'd go, trust me. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because you've got to think of yourself, your family and your career. And you know, agents are saying to them, and they're right, you've got maybe five, six years max at the top. You know, seven or eight if you're lucky. You've got to take advantage of it. You've got to do what you can to, to you know, to, to make sure you're financially secure for the rest of your life. So I get it, you know. I, I understand why players sometimes agitate for moves and all the rest of it and, and I, I'm a fan as well so it breaks my heart but you've just got to be philosophical about it you've got to stay that you know ultimately if a player becomes that good if your club isn't at the very top end of football he's going to gravitate towards the top end that's just going to happen 
Yeah, 100%. Um, so, your most recent film, uh, Johnny, is uh, Three Kings. Uh, you mentioned it a bit earlier. Tell me about that, because um, I could tell just by the you know the way you talked about it and in relation to your father, like it's obviously a special project to you. How did yeah. it kind of get off the ground and, and come about? And obviously tell us a bit about it as well. Well, there's a company called um, Box to Box, and they made um, uh, Maradona and the Ronaldo film. And they, they the lads were there and seen the I Believe in Miracles film and were very complimentary, and, and we got on really well. So then they were like, do you fancy doing something with us? And I was like, absolutely. Um, and so we had a chat, and I had this idea because my father gave it to me about doing something about the three of them being from the same part of Scotland and almost like inventing the modern sporting institutions of Manchester United, Celtic and Liverpool as we know them now. And they really liked that idea as well. So we decided to do it. We raised the money to make it um, and we managed to get it on Amazon involved. And so we did the film and what I wanted to do was make the film about men that existed in football decades ago now, but whose effect you can still see. Uh, and that's what I tried to do and I tried to use original footage and just try to use their voices and, and other people talking about them and just tell a new generation about these men, where they come from, what they brought to the game and how they affected modern football. Yeah, it's a special um it's a special film and like when you've got not just one focus for a documentary film, but you've got three special kind of characters to focus on. But they're all so similar and, and from the same area. It's quite a unique idea because so often a documentary is, you know, it's on one thing, isn't it? It's on one person or one subject. So to have the three of them be the focus, I really like that. Um, and obviously, the you know, critically, it's been received very well. Um, I'm assuming it didn't uh, didn't do too well on the DVD for uh, sales, though, Johnny, because times have changed now. Yeah, it went straight to streaming. I mean. It did, uh, it did really well in the cinemas because it was only out for two days and there was another lockdown. And it, was, it was a bit of a laugh. It was number one in the um, in the film document, well, the film charts because it was only out for a day and loads of uh, football fans went to see it. But um, yeah, it was um, it was a great series made in the 80s or in the early 90s called The Football Men, which was about them by the, the brilliant Hugh McElvenny, the Times writer. And I seen that and I really enjoyed it. But obviously, like all films and, and, and things, you know, it, it, it looked of its time. So I wanted to do something in a very much more uh, modern way, the way documentary films have been made much more now, which is lots of archive footage, dress in the voices. So you don't see people in vision being interviewed. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to do something that was brought to um, a modern audience and use, use modern music and things like that. Um, but yeah, I, it, listen, it got onto Amazon. It's on there now. It's done really well. It had five stars on there with all the reviews, which is great. I think there's a lot of Celtic. United Liverpool fans on Amazon. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was a bit like, I was pleased with that. And uh, yeah, well, it's one of those things, it's a bit like, don't take me home. And I believe in miracles once it's out there, it'll do whatever it's going to do the next three years, hopefully. Yeah, and I think it's something that people can go back to, even if they haven't watched it. When it's first come out, they might come across it when, you know, on Amazon or Netflix or something, and they'll yeah. be like, oh, I'll watch that. And then they, you know, and, and I think if someone who maybe doesn't know you, but just comes across one of those things, one of your films on Netflix, and they enjoy it, they're more likely to to sort of look, oh, who made this? And then they'll yeah. find your your other films. Um, you mentioned lockdown, mate. Has how has that like affected your projects and your work? Because it's you know it's been a year now, pretty much of being uh, it locked, is, locked in. A, I was talking to a mate about this today. Actually, this morning he was going. It's, it's, it's been a dreadful time for people, you know, in the sense of, you know, people have lost loved ones and, and you know, mental health issues, you know, being locked up. I think it's given us all a real um, realisation of how important that action is and lots of stuff that we took for granted, uh, you know, uh, we, we won't take for granted again, I, I wouldn't imagine, you know, just, I've, I've really missed the pubs, just missed that social side that, you know, just seeing your mates on a pint and on a, a decompress, as I call it. Um, what I've tried to do is, I've obviously, I've started the radio show. I've got a radio show now on Talk Sport called Johnny Owen and Friends. Uh, and I was lucky enough at the Times started to ask me to write a column. So I try to keep myself busy with that side of things. So I was able to do that. Very lucky, you know, in that respect. I managed to get three kings out as well. But very aware that it's been um, 
a dreadfully tough time for people. And um, I'm hoping that, you know, I got my first vaccine actually on Saturday. So, yeah, they're doing the, uh, doing the slightly younger age group now up here in Nottingham. So I'm just hoping that we can, by the summer, get back to, uh, to some kind of normality. And in football terms, just get the fans back. Get the fans back. The big thing here with, with Three Kings was Jock Steen famously said, and it's probably become the most famous day in ever now in football, football is nothing without fans. And it's taken this pandemic to, for us to all realize how right he was. You know, oh, how God, yeah. football just misses having supporters in, you know, and, and how important they are for the lifeblood of the game. So, you know, for me, um, I can't wait to see the full stadiums again. And I do think there'll be a big upsurge in people wanting to go to football. I think one of the things I've taken from the the whole pandemic is I won't say no so much to things anymore. I'll probably say yes for the first two or three yeah. years. <laughs> I haven't done it. <laughs> To do anything, I'm gonna be all right. I'll come. Yeah. So, and I think I hope, and I hope, like, no, let's say this, but everybody will probably feel the same. I think. I think there'll be a big resurgence this summer of people wanting to go out and wanting to sort of socialise and want to do lots of different things, and uh, that can only be a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Like I watched um, the South Wales derby on Saturday and then the Old Firm derby on Sunday, and it's just not the same without the fans. It's like it's not quite just another game, but it's. It's just not the same. It's not as hostile. It's not as passionate. There's just you know a bit of everything. And um, to finish us off, Johnny, tell me a bit about your writing. Tell him about Mick McCarthy and me. I, 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 What's I, I, me and Mick McCarthy. I said he. Yeah. Was oh yeah, yeah. So uh, where? He was the only person in South Wales. The only person in uh, in South Wales who who said he was going to do a good job. Although there um, yeah. there is there's one lady who watches uh, our football shows, uh, Donna, who said. She's been adamant since the moment, even when I was ranting on the championship show saying, oh, it's dreadful. And she was like, no, he's going to do a good job. He's going to do a good job. And uh, and then I messaged you, literally, I think it was that night, and I, we were talking about something else, and I sort of said, oh, what do you think? And you were like, oh, I think he'll do a good job. And, uh, and there we go. You well, were very, very right. What it is, I think the thing is, I'd seen him play, uh, manage, sorry, Ipswich a few times. They were very, very organised and hard to beat. Um, they give Forrest a bit of an eye in um, for two one game, and I thought, oh, these are all right. And then, of course, he leaves because it's such fans. This is the classic. Don't like the style of football, you know. You're like, all right, they go down almost straight away. And I was a bit like, you do a good job, somebody would. And I thought, we thought myself, City had players, you know, they got a good, got some good players there, Cardiff. And I really mm -hmm. like them more. I do think that uh, Harris was a bit unlucky with injuries because he missed. Um, more for a few weeks and of course he comes in more comes back gets them very well organized very physical they looked up for it in the South Wales derby which is all we ask for look like you want to win or you want to you want to get a result and they did that you know and, and you've got to give him and and the thing but what I really like about City fans I love City fans obviously they, they're great and they've been brilliant with me supporting everything I do is they've all gone oh I got that wrong and I love yeah. it yeah you know, they haven't held out with it and gone, oh, you know, I guarantee you'll mess it up in time. They've all embraced him. And I think whatever happens this season, when City fans go back to the to the Carver City Stadium, they'll give him a great welcome. I really believe that. You know what I mean? And, and they're terrific fans to get behind a manager. Neil Warnock says that, even to this day. And if, if, they, if they get behind you down there, which they always do, fair play to them, then, um, you know, it's a terrific, it's a terrific crowd to get, to get behind you. Hundred percent. They um, even Neil Harris. Like there was, there was genuine uh, kind of a bit of underwhelming reaction, perhaps when he signed as manager. But as soon as that initial sort of complaint is out of the way, it was very much we'll get behind him and we'll you know just see what he can do and. Did a good job, got us. Yeah, I, he I, did I, a good job last year. I just think yeah. he he made a few puzzling decisions this year, like like Aidan Flint has come back under Mick McCarthy and he looks like a top championship defender yeah. but he was out on loan because Neil Harris didn't fi fancy him and you know that's football I suppose and it's that's managers football. sometimes like see certain players see in training every week they see things we don't see listen football you know we made, I've made a living out of it it's all about opinions that's what makes it a great sport so you know sometimes people are going to agree with you sometimes they're not you know that's part of the game we've got 24 hour coverage radio stations rolling news because it's what makes it the game it is everybody's got an opinion about football which is great 
Absolutely. I uh, I seem to disagree with uh, with Andy about football every Monday and every Friday, <laughs> but it, it makes it it makes it all the more fun. We had um, we had Jeff Winter on. Um, it was a while ago, actually, a couple of months ago, and Andy reminded me of it yesterday because we had Andy's brother on last night, and um, he was talking about and he said he sat there for fifteen minutes while me and Jeff were just going back and forth on like a different, just a difference of opinion, and Andy just said he was just sat there in the middle, just sort of looking from side to side as we were just going back and forth. And but that's what makes this so good, isn't it? Difference well, of opinion. If you can play this to him as well, Andy, Andy scored the goal. That was one of the best nights ever that was when he scored that yeah. he's a legend forever now you know that's it oh, that's brilliant for him I mean he had one great I seen him once in a game he had a game a bit older and where God, won 6-0 I think and he was electric yeah man. brilliant uh, but that goal he scored he took it so well and that, that was one of the best nights ever really being a City fan in, in, in the capital it was just a great atmosphere that afternoon very nerve wracking actually he went to extra time I think didn't he yeah he wasn't comfortable they were a good team QPR then um and uh, but he scored that goal and just the relief around that stadium and I have loads of people again getting things wrong. So I remember a mate saying to me, uh, and then we got in the Premier League and I was like, that wasn't no. the Premier League. <laughs> Up and he was going, oh yeah, I forgot. And I was like, <laughs> so you know, you just, how difficult it was even to get out of League One then. The challenge. Oh God, yeah. It took us ages. It took us two years, didn't it? Yeah, well, I think the year before we'd lost to Stoke in the semi-final. Oh. And the year before that, I think we'd missed out on the last day or something of the playoffs. Yeah. But like, it's, I say to Andy all the time, it's really, it can be quite strange for me sometimes because that day was like, I look back at that, that was one of the, my, the best nights I've ever had after football. Like I was outside the City Arms until about four o'clock in the morning, just singing Cardiff songs. And it was sensational, like just surrounded. I think I was surrounded by strangers by the end. All my mates had gone home, just yeah. people I didn't know. And it was such a amazing atmosphere, and now he, Andy is like he's one of my closest mates, and it's Brilliant. just the way it goes, isn't it? But I uh, do two shows a week with him, and it's lovely. I mean, did you, did you ever did you go to Barnsley away in the FA Cup semi final? Uh, yeah, I think I did. Yeah, Ledley scored the goal. That's right. Yeah, the volley. I was City fans. They always go, yeah, that was an amazing atmosphere that, after that game when we won and we were in the FA Cup final. I just remember, like, I remember couldn't believe back, it. Ah, oh, I remember driving back and being on the Seven Bridge in a queue, and everybody getting out of the cars and like <laughs> the horns going. Yeah, there's been, and all the lows you have, and you do have lows, and it's, it's, there's misery. They, they're all worth it for those fleeting moments of, of, of ecstasy. You know what I mean? When it just comes. Yeah. And just, we deserve this. Do you know what I mean? I I never thought I would ever see Cardiff in a FA Cup final or a Cup final, no. like in my lifetime. And I've seen been to two, and I didn't think that we'd I'd ever see Cardiff in the top league in you know in my sort of at an age where I could kind of appreciate it and stuff. And I managed to see that, and I feel really lucky for that because, like, my father didn't get to see sort of that sort of glory when because he died when I was sixteen, and I think he was born after the sort of those big European nights and the, you know, the, the sort of successful era. So he, he, he kind of missed both. Um, yeah. So I feel quite, I'm. it's not lost on me that I feel quite blessed. Like there's City fans who are older than me who went a, long, a lot longer without yeah. that success. Yeah. So just... my, dad, my dad went to the, um, he was there the night they beat Real Madrid. He remembers that really well. I was just, it, was a year, it was two years before I was born. Um, and then I remember I, the thing with Cardiff was it was these, these the internationals at Linian Park, so you'd go to them, and they would need, they would be full a lot of the time. So you'd get forty odd thousand there. That's what I remember. Then the city games, you'd have like four thousand there, <laughs> literally mm -hmm. like it was that extreme. And then by the late eighties, I mean you, you were, they were, the, the crowds were tiny sometimes. You know, you'd, you'd, be, in, you'd be playing somebody like I, you know, Porky, and they'd be like they bring hundred and fifty. Gunthorpe and yeah, and I just yeah. remember big you know giant sort of cavern of a stadium and and, and you know hunched up under the pillar in the bob bank underneath the <laughs> i remember them very well but then when sam came in cardiff the city were always getting about 14 15 thousand then you know it, it, yeah. it, it start, and the ground always looked quite full didn't it you know and they did great then nice and all that there's always a good atmosphere i felt that that got it going again really for me 
yeah, he changed the whole expectation around yeah. what Cardiff, Cardiff City could be as a football club, didn't he? It just and created that kind of siege mentality almost between the fans and the players and everyone because they was all everyone against us sort of thing and yeah. and the fans started coming back like you said it was a, it was a good you know I know it went a bit sour but like that period of Sam you know where they beat Leeds in the FA Cup and that, just sensational it, whatever, whatever it ended up and it did end up whatever he did start he started of course he did yeah Cardiff wouldn't be where they are now or where they've been over the last couple of years without his Not him coming in you know how many times have they been on the brink of, you know, closing up shop? But over the years before he came in, yeah, yeah I remember. It's, uh, it's one of them, Johnny. Just very quickly, I wanted to ask you about your writing. You do a a column each Sunday. Is it, is it a Sunday or yeah, on the weekend? Sunday Times uh, in the section is called Johnny Owens Extra Time, and it's just me and my pontifications, my ramblings, I suppose, about football and culture and all that kind of thing. A bit like the show Johnny Owens and Friends on Talk Sport, nine o'clock till. 11 again that's just me talking about football culture all the stuff we're talking about what makes yeah football, you know the, the socializing your mates what pubs you go to what clothes you wear i've done one this week about what food we eat you know i even talked about clark's pies cardiff kids would love that best pie in the world is a clark's pie i explain that in this column well there you are that's a good way to to go full circle and wrap us up you just mentioned andy uh, against oldham in that game he scored uh, a hat trick against oldham and uh, well, I think it was his third goal. He uh, when he goes to celebrate, he gets one of the Oldham fans throws a pie at him and hits him in the face, and he ends up with ke- ketchup all over his face. But uh, there we go. Um, yeah, I suppose better to be it by a pie than a coin. I suppose, isn't it? Um, no, Johnny. Thank you very much for your time, mate. I really appreciate uh, you finding the time to talk and talk to me. And I yeah, thoroughly enjoyed uh, talking about your career and stuff. And uh, it's just been a pleasure, as always, my friend. You're very welcome, mate. Good luck with it all. And uh, very well done, mate. Proud of you all you've started and where you've ended up. It just goes to show and what you can do. Fair play to you. Thank you very much, mate. Deeply appreciated. Um, guys, subscribe. YouTube.com slash Ace Podcast Nation and uh, the audio versions at all the usual podcast platforms. And uh, we'll be back next Sunday with another episode of My Story. And uh, don't forget to check out the football shows every Monday and Friday live. Uh, on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter. Until then, I bid you farewell. Cheers. Champion, a champion.